Thank you, Richard. Uh, and let me thank uh, Tibor and Joe and uh, the university for inviting us here. It's my first trip to West Texas. Um, I came from northern Vermont yesterday, and you have no mountains here. And uh, it's about 70 degrees warmer here than it was at home when I cleaned snow off my car yesterday. Um, I, I was delighted to get the invitation to come here, but I was a little <coughs> bit nervous, um, a little concerned, and I talked to Ron about it, and he said, well, no, you're just going to speak for about 10 minutes on uh, why the Middle East is so messed up. <laughs> and, and I was reminded of a story of a British archaeologist at the turn of the century, 20th century, uh, opening of the 20th century in Victorian England, um, who, a British archaeologist who had spent a career in uh, Southeast Asia uncovering temples and doing research on ancient Southeast Asian civilizations, and at the end of his career was invited to give a talk at the British Museum in London. And, but they said, now, Professor, you should talk for no more than 30 minutes, and then there'll be some questions, and, and thank you so much. And he wanted longer time, and they said no. And he spluttered to his friend, Oscar Wilde, the, the British wit and writer, and said, how can I possibly explain everything I know in just 30 minutes? And Oscar Wilde said, well, speak slowly. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to speak sort of slowly. Um, I'm going to make, I'm going to try to make three points, which is number one, um, the countries in the Middle East, um, many of them are structurally weak from their very beginning. And so what we have seen in recent years with the Arab Spring and other tumultuous events is, is not to be uh, a surprise. I mean, it, it was coming for a long time is I think what I'm trying to say. Um, there are some exceptions, but most of these states are structurally weak. So I'm going to talk very briefly about that. Then I want to talk about what happens when governments become weak, and in particular what happens when other armed groups, non-government organizations, militias, Islamic State type things, uh, when they arise. What helps them arise and what happens? And then the last thing I want to talk about is um, where is the Middle East going from here? Um, what's going to happen in places like Iraq and Syria and Libya, places that are all in the news now? So um, speaking slowly, but not too slowly, the first thing I, I just remind people is that the map of the modern Middle East as we see it today, 2016, it didn't exist 100 years ago. There was a great big Ottoman Empire um, with some colonial protectorates carved out of it, but those were temporary. They were always intended to be temporary. Um, and after the First World War, uh, borders were drawn, but they didn't correspond to linguistic or ethnic groups on the ground. They slopped right over them. They ignored them. Now, that's important. That's important. I want you all to think for a minute about Europe or like Hungary. Um, pretty much everybody in Hungary speaks Hungarian. Tibor will know better than me. But when I went to Hungary, everybody spoke Hungarian. And they're all sort of from one ethnic community. They're all Hungarians. Um, it's the same thing like with Japan. They're all Japanese, more or less, and they all speak Japanese, and they're all one culture. But the Middle East has traditionally been home to many different cultures, um, and they have survived that way for millennia. And so the borders that were drawn, uh, in some cases by Britain and France, in some cases by the countries themselves, don't necessarily correspond to the linguistic and ethnic groups on the ground. Let me give you a very quick example. Uh, the border between Syria and Turkey, Turkey in the north, Syria below. Anybody know how that border was drawn? It follows a railroad line that the Kaiser's Germany was building before World War I. The Kaiser wanted to increase trade with the Ottoman Empire, so he was paying for a railroad to be built. After World War I, actually in the 1930s, the French government acting on behalf of its Syrian colony and the new Turkish Republic drew that border. And they basically said, what's north of the railroad 
is Turkey. What's south of the railroad is Syria. Well, there were Kurdish communities living on both sides of that railroad line. I mean, the family might have one brother on the north side, had a house or a farm or something over there, and the other brothers, sisters, parents maybe were on the south side, or vice versa. All of a sudden, there's a border. The brother, the cousins are Turkish citizens with Turkish passports, and on the south side of the railroad tracks, oh, they're Syrian citizens with Syrian passports. Oh, and there's a border gate. You can't just go back and forth anymore. Similar kinds of things happened in Iraq. In Iraq, they sort of hodgepodged some provinces that had more or less been autonomous within the Ottoman Empire. They just glued them all together. The British did that. Uh, and so that's why you have big Kurdish community in the north of Iraq. Kurdish is their language. Young people up in that part of Iraq today don't even speak Arabic. But down in the south, they're all Arabs. So imagine having a country where you, uh, the national language isn't spoken by 25% of the population, and they're all in one area. So it's just it's inherently going to be unstable. The people in the north, the Kurds, don't think that they're Arabs. Um, there's something similar in North Africa uh, between the indigenous population, uh, who are Berbers, it's the name of the group, it's an ethnic group, linguistic group. Uh, Arabs only came in uh, at the end, or at the beginning of the eighth century. Um, and even today, Berbers don't view themselves as Arabs. When I went to uh, Algeria for my first time, and I started speaking Arabic to um, an Algerian parliamentarian, he got quite mad at me when I was speaking Arabic. I mean, he said to me in French, don't speak Arabic to me. I'm not an Arab. I'm an Algerian, but I'm not an Arab. And I thought, oh, well, terribly sorry. I thought Algeria was an Arab country. He said, no, we're Berbers. There are Arabs here, but I'm not an Arab. And so, you know, it, the Arabization of the country had only happened 1,300 years before. No reason to assume that it changed. So, I mean, it, we laugh. We laugh here because the United States has a history of absorbing immigrants. But we don't discriminate against immigrants the way countries over there have done so. Remember that the governments are usually authoritarian. They usually represent one community out of several. They usually don't share power. They usually take care of their own, and the others are left out. And so they do remember these things. So when you have a shock, like the United States invades Iraq and Saddam Hussein is toppled, or you have the Arab Spring come and there are massive protests, uh, these governments, which can be very authoritarian, very hard, but they're also brittle, cracks can open where suddenly people in neighborhoods don't want the police because the police aren't from their communities. They might speak a different language. They might come from a different ethnic or sectarian group. They don't want the police. And what happens when there's no police, there's no security forces? The communities, the neighborhoods will set up their own. In Iraq, this happened when the American soldiers came and the Iraqi police ran away. They didn't dare go out into neighborhoods because people would have attacked them because they had been so corrupt and so repressive. All of a sudden, we started seeing neighborhood watches set up, and then we started seeing Sunni and Shia militias both set up. In Syria, peaceful protests, the government reacts with violence, people say no police around here, and they start setting up their own self-protection forces. That happened within three or four months of the peaceful protest marches starting. In Libya, Muammar Gaddafi is overthrown, and immediately, the tribal people in eastern Libya are arguing with the tribal people in western Libya. Libya had never been a single country before uh, until really the 20th century. And so they didn't agree. Why, why are you Westerners running our affairs in the east? So these states can be hard, but they're very brittle. And when you get these non-government organizations, these militias setting up, uh, control becomes even harder. The Islamic State is the ultimate in this kind of non-government military force taking ground and holding it. The Islamic State, by the way, is not like Al-Qaeda at all. It has soldiers. It has a ministry of defense. It has a bureaucracy. It runs schools. It runs hospitals. It doesn't run them well. And these days, uh, it's having trouble paying people. 
But while Osama bin Laden was hiding out in a cave in Afghanistan, the Islamic State has government buildings and a government bureaucracy. It even writes parking tickets. No, I'm not kidding, it does. So I suspect people pay their parking tickets. <laughs> so, so it controls this large space. And what happens when an armed group or Islamic State controls big territory in Libya or Syria, Iraq? Then what? Or a Shia militia? Or The problem becomes even worse when neighboring countries get involved. Syria, Iraq, perfect examples. Libya, same thing. Uh, in Syria, Iran is helping the Assad government and is even sending over militia fighters from Iraq, of all places. The very people that we were fighting in Sadr City 10 years ago are now on the ground in Syria fighting rebels against Bashar al-Assad. And who's helping them? The Turks and the Saudis. The Russians have come in on Bashar al-Assad's side. We have been helping some rebels half-heartedly against Assad. It becomes a great big mess, great big mess. Similar things have happened in Turkey. The Turks have given security guarantees to the Kurds in the north. They want the oil. The Iranians have been giving help to Shia militia in the center of the country. And the prime minister of Iraq, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Shia, the Iran has been giving help to Shia militias in Iraq. in Iraq. The prime minister of Iraq, whom I know well, Haider Abadi, is not a particularly sectarian guy. He's actually, I, I think he's a good politician. I, it reminds me sort of of Joe Biden, actually. Um, <laughs> kind of comes in, pats on the back, tells a joke. But he doesn't have much power because those Shia militia and those Kurdish militia are a lot stronger than the little Iraqi army that we're now trying to rebuild, the one that fell apart. So it's tough when the foreign neighbors get involved. And so reasserting control, reasserting control from the central government, from Damascus, from Baghdad, from Tripoli and Libya, it's going to be very hard. You're going to have to get agreement among the foreign neighbors who have their clients on the ground, their proxies on the ground. The United Nations is now trying to do something in Libya, but they've got to get agreement from the Emiratis, the United Arab Emirates, and the Saudis who are helping one faction, from Turkey and Qatar that are helping another faction uh, to put together a new national unity government. The United Nations is trying to get peace talks started in Syria. That'll happen this Thursday in Geneva, but they've got to get, again, Turkey, Iran, Russia, the United States, Saudi Arabia, all to agree on how this would be done. And then you have to get the Syrians on the ground with all their ancient angers and hatreds and fears to agree as well. Very hard. And in Iraq, trying to keep the government together it was a challenge when I was there, and it's harder now than ever. So where do we come out? One thing that may happen, maybe they'll get some kind of central governments reestablished, maybe. If they do, they'll probably be heavily decentralized. That means they won't be run um, with heavy hand out of the capital. Local people will have more authority over local affairs because they'll still have local militias on the ground. Or second possibility is they're just going to be partitioned, kind of the way Cyprus was. If the Turkey came in and took over the northern part of Cyprus, Turkish community there. Um, Cyprus has never been fully reunited ever since then, for 40 years. Um, or the third is that we could, in the end, see new countries come and the maps change. Um, 40 years ago, when I was in high school, uh, there was a country in the middle of Central Europe called Yugoslavia. Fast forward 40 years, there is no Yugoslavia. There's Bosnia, there's Croatia, there's Slovenia, there's Macedonia. Um, there is no Yugoslavia. And we could see in places such as Iraq, Syria, uh, maybe even Libya, we could see new countries. I can imagine very easily, for example, that in the next 20 years, we will see an independent Kurdish state coming out of territory that is now controlled by Kurdish militia in Syria, one Kurdish militia, and another Kurdish militia in Iraq. Um, I can imagine those two coming together and creating an independent Kurdistan, which will be its own challenge. So. I tried not to speak too slowly, and thank you so much, Dick. <laughs>